All right, if there's no questions, Christina on more persistent homology. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jessica, for a really great introduction of, of precision homology, and I might go deeper into the mathematical side. And also, my topic is the mathematical approach of a real-world problem, so the mathematical part will not be so uh, rigorous, and I just want to show you guys how um, mathematician is trying to solve a real-world problem. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I just grabbed an example from Jessica's presentation, um, and this is a picture of a wood cell and what we want to do is to get the position of each cells and also the contour of each cell just the shape of different shell so um yeah and as a computer we, we, we are going to uh, left the problem to come to computer right so for a computer so um i will ask someone to take a picture for me so i will be offered an image of wood cells and then i want to make things easier because i'm a computer i don't want to be so tired so i would just put things everything in grayscale because what we only need to do is to recognize the structure so everything becomes in one color and thirdly i want to make things rough so that i can do my task effortlessly so what do we need to do to catch a robust feature so we can just blur the whole picture and then um, there's a question, how can a computer find cell? Because a human always can extract a shape from a picture uh, naturally, but for computer, they cannot. And because computer cannot analyze darkness. So the question for computer is where to start. And for smart people, they give us an answer, which is height filtration, which Jessica also mentioned. The head, the head filtration, um, uh, innocent computer again asks the question, what do you mean of darkness? Computers don't really know darkness, right? So we need to assign a value for darkness. For example, uh, from low to high is from dark to light. So you can see this color is the, uh, with the lowest uh, value and this the highest value. So innocent computer again have a comment. I see. So as I don't know how, don't know what color means, can I just visualize them as height? So Christina's answer is yeah, sure, because com what a computer has is only the value. So a computer can absolutely visualize them as height. So the picture uh, there for computer is just like this. And then computer will again ask a question, where to start? And smart people offer the answer. We can start from lower to higher value arbitrarily. You can also start from higher to lower so that the, whole, the analysis of the picture becomes like this. It's from lower to higher value, which is from dark to, to light. And then we, we, we just sweep up, sweep up with the thresholds along the image from a low to high to, to high height. And there's also a 3D representation. Okay, uh, and uh, we got a result of the object organization. We got a control of everything we want, which is uh, for this picture, I guess, it's just this part because it is the um, most important things we want to get from the picture. So you can see we get this contour and we know this part is something really important because it is very long lasting. And then we just, we just apply the height um, filtration to the image segmentation. And this is our result. Yeah, so um, for this part, just remember this white part actually turned out to be the darker part when we um, apply it to a gray skull. So it just become like this, the connected component. They're spinning, spinning, and they then connected together and things rapidly change into this scary picture. So what we want, want is actually probably something in the middle is this, this part. In this part, every contour is pretty clear and this is probably the picture we want. So for a computer, this leads to some problem. Innocent computer have three problems for us. First of all, why should I start from a value instead of a vert vertex depends on its position in 3D. So what's the benefit for us to start from low value to high value instead of start from a random point? For example, from the corner, because that's more organized. Second question is that how a block of dark area is connected to other to another. Like what's the rule of two co connected components to be connected? 
And thirdly is, if I scan the figure this way, where should I stop? I guess you all noticed that this is really scary result. We don't really want to get this result. So where should we start in the middle? And so mathematicians here step out and they want to solve this problem by um, position homology. Yeah, so um, um, we just talk about uh, color recognition, but here we want to do something simpler. We just have some data point in, in the figure and um, on well, how we define the color is through a value, it is through a heat value, but here we want to define the that value as the radius, as the radius r. So if two uh, points are connected, like uh, they are, they have intersection with the circle around them. And um, the remainder is that this picture is offer a shallow approach of mathematical theory, and, but I also attach some link which lets you have uh, more rigorous proof or something. So if you're interested, you may go to the link and I will send a PDF. Um, so then we're going to some mathematical background here. Uh, first is definition of metric space, which you're familiar with. It is a, a set and a function which define distance in the, in the set. And we also have Hausdorff distance, which uh, defined the distance between two compact subsets. Uh, however, this is not the important point. The important, point. the important point is here, how we define the distance function. We're given a compact subset K of RD uh, and a non-negative real number R. Um, and the union boss of radius R centered on the, all the vertices in K is, K is represented as KR, and it is the unions of boss centered and the point at every um, vertices in K. And how we define the distance function DK is from RD to R. It is defined by DKX equals to the infimum of its Euclidean distance with other uh, vertices. And so we can get also get this in, in, uh, result of the inverse. And then we can go to, uh, this is really important uh, things that we, we need to remember because we're going to see later. Um, and uh, this is, and then we're going to do the simplicial complex, which we already discussed in class. So simplex is basically the um, general, like generalization of triangle and tetrahedron in a higher dimension. And it also has some algebraic um, expression. And the simplicial complex is just a set of simplex and uh, which have two registered Restriction and we already discussed it in class. And as for TDA, there's a two important simplicial complex that we are going to use, and and the, their name is Chag complex and also Via Torres Ribs complex, which um, Jessica also mentioned. And um, before talking about a specific mathematical def definition, I would. I would uh, have a remark here is that those two can be considered as a unions of ball. They are built uh, on the base point of the units of ball, but the rule of how to use the baseball to, to like define themselves are different. So first for check complex, check complex is defined as um, a set of simplices, such as uh, such that K plus one close ball uh, BX, XI alpha has a non empty intersection. Which means that um, for the complex, for the complex check, it is a set of simplex, and for each simplex, the ball, the ball inside the simplex must have non-empty intersection. And then the ribs, ribs uh, complex is much more easier. It just the simplex it have in its complex is just um, uh, there are all the all the pair of vertices. Its distance is less than two alpha. So. Uh, as, as you can see in the first glimpse, check is more um, delicately um, de defined than the ribs because it only needs like for each two pair, but this one is need uh, uh, like in, like all the things in the simplex to have a non-empty uh, intersection. So here's an interesting video that we can we can tell the difference. All right. And um, sorry, I will mute him. Um, okay, so this is the point we we just. Uh, increase over scope power meter, and then we can see the difference of uh, check and ribs. Oh, so this one is some is, is one of the uh, check and ribs, and this one is one of the check and ribs. Can anyone guess which one is which one? Um, I was I will tell the answer. Um, this one is actually check, and this one uh, this one is actually ribs, and this one's check, because as you can see for this three, just as I say these three um, circles and these two are connected. 
uh, and these two are connected and these two are connected. So they're considered as a triangle uh, in uh, ribs. However, for check, they don't consider this as a tri as a triangle. They only consider like this two as a simplex, this two as a simplex, because um, they don't have a common intersection. So yeah, I just have a whiteboard. So if you have, this is the, um, this is the, why we, oh, this is the ribs and this is the check. And for this one, you will, you will um, fill this triangle because uh, these two each connected and these two don't have a common intersection. These three don't have a common intersection, so you won't fill this triangle. So that's basically the difference of check complex and uh, reator ribs, ribs complex. And in general, they're, they, they're probably the same, but they are different in a tiny little point. First, a uh, check complex is theoretically preferred because it can remain the property of unions of law under homotopy equivalence. So oh, let's see, um, the, the empty things here is actually the whole of the union space, uh, of the union uh, of circles, uh, of balls. Yeah. And uh, second, in a high dimension space, uh, when we want to do the task of finding intersection, um, it is pretty hard because we need to consider a lot of things. However, the uh, real torus rift is much simpler because what we, we, what we need to do is to, come, is to calculate things pairwise. So we just need to check each pair. However, they are all approaching the same goal as estimating the shape of data in a larger scope. And then it's the definition of homeomorphism and homotopy. I will just don't mention it because we already discussed. And then comes a pretty important theorem called the nerve theorem. Um, nerve theorem ex explains the reason that why we can use the unions of ball, like, like check complex in precision homology as we ex as the uh, extractive feature of data. Like why can we extract feature data in a persistent way? That's what the nerve theorem wanna show us that we can do that. First, we can define a cover mu. It is um, the cover mu is actually the uh, finite subspace, um, a sub finite subset of uh, complex, which uh, is the finite uh, subset of a uh, set U and uh, of a set mu M, and uh, such that the M is equal to the combination of um, every subset uh, that um, that containing mu. So the and also we can def define nerves upon uh, cover and the nerves um, mu. The nerves of mu is the abstract abstract simplicial complex, and um, it just like we can see it this way because uh, it is just defined as for, for each vertices in the simplex. Um, they have to be have they have to have a uh, non 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 trivial intersection so that they can they can be put in a, a simplex and then those simplex are forms a complex. So generally speaking, the nerves of a finite collection of set F consists of not all non empty sub collection whose sets have non trivial uh, common intersection. So as we can use example to to, to say. This is um, the subset of uh, a bunch of points which we denote as M. And we have U1, U2, U3. The combination of these three are the whole picture. So they are a cover. And then we can use, uh, and then uh, the nerve is like this two. They, they form a, a, a unit in nerve and this two form, there's these two forms. And then um, the whole picture is homotopic equivalent to the triangle here. Oh, and this is actually the things in the nerve theorem. Things can be represented as a as a triangle, and the nerve the nerve theorem is talking about that if any intersection of sets in uh, the nerve of mu is either empty or contractible, then uh, the nerve of mu is homotopic equivalent to um to the uh, to the topological space that we define the cover and the nerve. And for the proof, it's pretty hard, so we may ask Ritter for help. <laughs> And I didn't even search search for that theorem because I cannot find it. And so I don't have the link. Um, and then we're going to talk about the main part, persistent homology. And uh, a really interesting question is that homology is just the just asks is that as one increases the threshold, at what scale do we observe 
changes in some representation of the data. So persistent homology is something that records all the changes and the persistent feature. And as we talk about persistent homology, we need to um, have a definition of filtration. Uh, a filtration of, of the simplicial complex K is just like um, if the uh, if um, K K with uh, like higher index contain that contain the index of lower low uh, contain the K of lower index. It just like if you go from K one to K five because K five have a higher index of five, so it will contain K four. So K four contain K K three, and K three contain K. Two, K2 contain K1, and the, the, the index here is called a scope parameter. And uh, then we can introduce two important filtration that we used in TDA. Um, the first is via Torres rib filtration. Um, via Torres ribs and, and check our filtration, uh, we, we, it is pretty obvious because we only add edge when we uh, like increase the, para the, pa the parameter. So there, their filtration. Um, so this is a picture of a real torus rib filtration. No. Oh. Yeah. And uh, we also have check filtration, which is uh, which we can use the nerve theorem to prove that um, the, the filtration uh, check will remain its topological feature when we increase the, 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 the parameter from zero to uh, infinite. Um, and um, yeah, and this is, and for this picture, it is actually homotopic equivalent with homotopy equivalent to um, check uh, filtration. And yeah. And then we may go to the application of persistent homology. And the important question, as I mentioned, is that um, when the parameter R increases, we will have new connected components and we will uh, we will have something merged, but but also loops and KBD something will be appear will be filled. And persistent homology track this feature and it, it also track they also use the interval to try with lifetime. It is t birth and t death. The t here actually don't refers to the to the time. It refers to the uh, parameter at the time. And uh, we can use uh, you can, as you can see, um, these are different picture figure. But people don't really use figure to do analysis, right? Um, but they use a diagram. So here we have a very interesting things called persistent barcode to help us better analyze this picture. So here, the reason why we start at here is that uh, at this point, this larger loops appear, and at this point, um, this smaller loop appear, and at this point, it, the smaller loop disappears, so it ends here. But there's the larger loop is still here, so we just do it do it consistently, and until it was end. And um, a pretty important thing is that how why can we use barcode to define the lifetime of feature? Uh, so here we may define something called persistent module. Um, uh, so I won't go rigorously into mathematics here, um, but you can just consider the persistent module as, as the vector of linear map that con con like that connect like the homotopy uh, group of um, uh, homology groups of um, the uh, filtration we used. Uh, so if we look at this picture, you will see that the future, the, the um, persistent homology here is actually changing from zero to um, Z2, or from Z2 to DZ2, or from Z2 to zero, or from, yeah, just this three. If you go from Z2 to D2, it is an identity map, which means that the feature preserved. And if you go from zero to Z2, there's actually the emergence of new feature. And you go from Z2 to zero, it's actually the disappearance of a feature. So uh, this is theorem to prove that we can actually use this this uh, um, uh, persistent module and this proves the uh, existence of the persistent barcode, and which is the visualization of Betty, the Betty number. Yeah, so uh, there's not there's a, a more algebraic uh, expression of this is in this uh, this is in this article of persistent barcode. So we can just consider it as the multi set of interval of in R, which records the t birth and t death. 
And we can also change the persistent barcode to persistent diagram. The, the T birth and T death here are the start and end of an interval. But here we can uh, use them as, as the X and Y coordinates. So here we just, um, for example, this is like 1, 2, 10. And we just add a number 1, 10 here. And if it is a 2, 2, 5, we, we just add a point 2, 5 here. Yeah. And uh, also, I would, um, yeah, I don't know if you noticed that this, lo this like longer loops, persistent, persistent longer than this, like smaller loops. Uh, so it actually, um, like, is up here higher of higher up here above this diagonal. But this one, this one of the um, smaller loops actually, um, pretty approach this diagonal, which means that this one is actually a better figure rather than this one uh, of this uh, whole figure as we extract feature from it. And if we have the diagram here, we can just change it uh, through some uh, mathematical tra transformation to a topological landscape, which looks like this. And here, the higher it is, the uh, like more uh, robust feature it is. So um, here we can go back to the real-world application. So just do a little summary of the workflow. First, we have some metric data set, and they're recorded in a like, data point. And then we use uh, the filtration and just uh, increase, increase the parameter. And then we get a diagram we use to analyze. And then we may go back to our PowerPoint and see what uh, see if we answered all the questions we have. So for the first question, why should I start from the value? Because this is what persistent homology is about. It is about connecting uh, different components from the parameter zero to parameter infinite. They will, yeah. And the benefit is pretty obvious. And second, how are blocks of dark areas connected to each other? What's the rule? So we, we may just change the parameter here. We change the parameter from the distance to the value. So this is how they're connected. But um, the basic idea is the same. And thirdly, if, we, if I scan the figure this way, when should I stop? So this is a really good question that we can answer through by the um, persistence um, diagram or persistence landscape. Uh, obviously, those things are, are going to be so persistent in a persistent diagram. They will be like much higher than a diagonal than this component because they appear, they, they just like goes immediately. So they, they will be really close to the diagonal. So we, we're just going to, uh, so at this point might be something uh, much higher than the diagonal, which is probably this, this node, th this point. So here we find a special point and then we stop in that picture and then we successfully identify the contour and the position of different uh, cells. And for more application of persistent homologies, actually more, more application of image segmentation, it is in the driverless, driverless, driverless car because it needs like 3D clarification of object. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's probably all of my presentation. And thank you for listening. And let me see the problem. Oh, well, thanks so much. Um, any questions for Christina? I had a question. So is there anything from persistent homology or any other tool that can tell whether the figure in your paper, that monkey, or like monkey head, that that's that actually came from 3D somehow, because to us it looks 3D, right? But a computer, it's oh. like a 2D picture. I do think that um, precision homology can analyze the shade. I don't know. You can, you can. I think you can actually analyze the shade because it is 3D, so it must have some shade. Yeah, just intuitively. I don't know. I think I think that would be interesting. Or uh, I'm yeah. sure it needs to be looked into more. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and Victor wants your paper because he wants to prove the thing you want him to prove, I think. Okay, Pranav? 
Maybe I'll just share my screen. I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, I see. And then after this, we'll take a break and Eric and Fiona.